Namaste. Namaste. I want to disabuse you of the idea that this is about heaven at all. Or salvation, or acceptance, or even God. This gospel story. The king is not God, even though you've been told the king is God. The banquet is not heaven, even though we're used to thinking of wedding banquets as heaven. It's about something else entirely, and what it's about is that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And it's about two of the Noble Eightfold Path, which are, and I wrote them down here, right view, because I can never remember all eight, right intention, right speech, and then number four is right action, number five is right livelihood, number six is right effort, number seven is right concentration, and number eight is right mindfulness. The Noble Eightfold Path is the Buddha's path for getting to enlightenment, sort of. Because the Buddha's Four Noble Truths are, life is unsatisfactory, we do stuff to make it worse, there's a way out of it, and the fourth one is the way out of it, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. And I want to say that the whole problem about the wedding banquet is about right action and right effort. And there's one other thing you need to know. Wedding guests at Jewish weddings were provided with robes to wear for the wedding. So while you might hear some people preach this story and talk about how sad it was that the person who didn't have the wedding clothes on probably couldn't afford the wedding clothes, no, 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 no. Not right. But it might be kind of like the Episcopal Church, the poor slob that has to train the children that are acolytes, which was me and Springberg. Because it never failed in the church that I did this in, the, the kids that were acolytes wore these robes that were, um, they were made of broadcloth, flax colored broadcloth, which isn't quite as transparent as a bed sheet, but it's pretty darn close. And inevitably, some kid on spring break in high school, his parents would take him down to Florida and they'd eat at some place called Vinny's that serves crabs, right? So he gets a t-shirt from Vinny's, and the next thing you know, he's walking down the aisle holding the processional cross over his head, and through his robe it says, Vinny's got crabs. <laughs> <laughs> because he didn't stop to think that that was going to show in those big bright letters <laughs> through this not quite transparent wedding garment. And there were a lot of those. And it wasn't just the guys, too, you know. You know, and it might say on the back, eat Vinny or something. Who the hell? It was terrible, you know. Yeah, Vinny's got crabbed. And it was worse if the kid's name was Vinny, you know. But <laughs> this isn't, to me, anyway, a story about what makes you acceptable to God at all. It's a story about how much we resist what I want to call spiritual evolution. How much we run away from, for a whole pile of reasons, whatever it is that's best for us. Whether it's a kid saying, you know, this Vinny eats crab, or Vinny's got crab, this is going to show through that robe, and you know he's going, but this will fire him up. <laughs> So he wears it anyway, and you know, they make, we make him turn it inside out, and then all that happens is those of us who've gotten good at reading things backwards go, <laughs> look, it says Vinny eats crabs, and they made him turn it inside out. He's actually got crabs. Yes, yeah, he does. He probably Anyway. We like to think that we're all chomping at the bit for what's best for us. But we all aren't. All you have to do is be around a teenager. And you know that we all aren't chomping at the bit for what's best for us. In fact, they are often chomping at the bit for what's worst for them. But at least in teenagers, there's a reason, right? They're trying to decide who they are, trying to establish this independent identity. Um, this the psychological term is they're doing individuation. How am I different from my parents? So they go do stupid stuff 
and it's really okay because it's part of being a teenager. But none of the people, that, at least as far as we can tell in this story, that were invited to the wedding were teenagers. Right? So somebody comes out and says, hey, there's a free party, there's a free meal, and it's a good meal. All you have to do is come over and toss on the robe. I'm there. Yeah. But there's people, and you know there's people, who are going to say, I don't want to wear the robe. I think the robe looks stupid. I can't tell you how many times I used to go out. There's a religious supply house in Brookfield called Robert Gaspard Company. Mm. And they used to have an annex room. And once or twice a year, they'd have a sale in the annex room. And they'd have all these bags from Pick and Save. And you could stuff as much crap as you could get into a Pick and Save bag for $20 or $25. So I'd go out there and think, oh, the church is coming for the annual meeting. I'd put five robes in there that would have cost them over $100 a piece. Buy the whole bag for 20 or 25 bucks. And just go, here, take one. If you don't have a robe and you need a robe, and I buy, well, small is out of the question, but I buy <laughs> medium, large, extra large, and ones with grommets that used to be tents, right? So something would fit everybody. <laughs> and there would always be those people who would take one, oh, this is great. And then we'd have our big thing on Saturday, and they'd be walking in without a damn robe on. Which is, you know, what do I care, but it's this. It's like, just wear the robe. Wear the robe for an hour. <laughs> One day a year. You know, it'd be Bermuda shorts, a shirt was from a cruise, you know. <laughs> it didn't say Vinny has crabs, but pretty close. And I just kind of shake my head until finally I said, well, okay. No matter what the benefit, there's people that aren't going to put the robe on. I knew somebody who I was all ready to ordain a bishop. And we were going to do it at somebody else's place with other people there being ordained a bishop. And all she had to do was wear that ugly pointed hat for one hour. I said, I'll buy the hat. I don't care if you ever wear the hat again as long as you live. <laughs> I don't care if you give it back or throw it away. You just have to wear the hat for one hour because everybody else is going to be wearing the hat. Nope. Won't do it. Nobody you know. Okay. It'll mess with my hair. Yeah. Well, no, the argument was... It, I'm from the South, it'll make me look like a Klansman. The problem was, more than half of the people being ordained and ordaining were people of color. So it kind of invalidates, given that they were all going to wear the hat, the whole Klansman argument. But there's some hang-up we have that gets between us and the goal we want to achieve. And most often, we don't see it. Now, those are real churchy examples, so let's bring it down to earth. Our daughter gets a job at a particular establishment that says, don't charge your cell phone. If we find you charging your cell phone, we're going to confiscate the charger. She leaves enough chargers behind, meaning pretty clear evidence that in the stall she was sitting in, she was charging her phone, that she gets written up often enough that she's about to lose her job because she's charging her cell phone, never mind that there's a car charger in her car where she could have charged it. But the idea, it's kind of like once somebody says, whatever you do, don't do, that. Don't do this. And it's the first thing you got to do. <coughs> Richard Pryor used to tell a story uh -huh. <laughs> that I won't quite repeat about his uncle telling him not to engage in a particular practice with young women. And he used to say, I couldn't wait. Because <laughs> his uncle said, whatever you do, don't ever do this. And Richard was banging the go. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> choice of words there, bud. Yeah, well, it wasn't quite that. It was a preliminary practice. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's true. There's something about our nature that if somebody says, you can do anything but this, there's something in us that makes us go, wonder how I can do that and get away with it. <laughs> you know, maybe if I only do it for a little bit. Maybe 
if I do it for just a second. Maybe if I only fantasize about doing it. Or somebody says, you come into the feast, toss on the robe. And not only are we saying we don't want to wear the damn robe, we're not even smart enough to stay away from the feast. I mean, at least the, any of the people who said, I have other things to do, were really thinking, man, I don't want to wear that ugly robe, but I'm not going to tell them that's the issue. I'm just going to say I'm busy. So then, why does the king send out some people to whip up on them? Because they too, having, I think metaphorically, not literally, but having opportunity laid open before them, Decided something else was better. You mean, if I show up, you're going to pay me a thousand dollars? I got movie tickets. You know, there are those people <laughs> that you just can't help, no matter how hard you try. And there's at least two sides to those people. One is, if you're the person trying to help them, you have to let it go. You have to say, I did my best. And there's a part of right action and right effort that is about that. You know, how often do we cover up for our partner's drinking before we finally say, you know what, we're going to have to let him be accountable. It's the only way we're going to get him to change. We've tried our best, we got to let it go. How often are we going to, with the holidays coming up, going to go to holiday meals that turn into really unpleasant sort of arguments or the same old shit being played out year after year after year after year. I like, I love this wasn't year after year, but my dad's father could pray forever. <laughs> Saying... When, I, when my dad said, Dad, would you like to say grace? It was like, well, who's going to be cold now? Because <laughs> he, he was a high school teacher, but he was a Methodist uh, lay minister who had a church during World War II. It's like, holy shit. Worse than that, I think he'd probably been evangelical United Brethren or something, most of them were, which is like a Methodist Nazi. You know, Methodists are methodical. These are obsessive-compulsive Methodists, right? Church for everyone. And so one year... They're praying, he's praying, and my brother and I had seen this, I probably told you this before, this TV show about hippies for Jesus when we were up north. Yeah. And it must have been my brother's birthday in September, and um, my grandpa starts praying, and you know, five minutes later, he's done. My brother, who's like eight or nine, looks up and goes, right on with Jesus. <laughs> the rest of us went, oh shit. <laughs> but fortunately, my grandfather couldn't decide if that was like heartfelt or not. <laughs> So it just kind of slid past. Yeah, I think he decided it was heartfelt and it slid past. But you could say my brother was too stupid to get out of his own way. Adrian Peterson, right, gets arrested for beating his kid with a switch. One of his conditions of parole is that he go has urine, have urine tests for drugs. This week he shows up to drop his cup and says, yeah, I smoked a little weed this week. <laughs> You're too stupid to get out of your own way, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think that is what this is about. That there's, there's a part of all of us that is too stupid to get out of our own damn way. And, and if we work on that, we can overcome that. We can say, I'll charge my phone at home. Maybe it's not a good idea to smoke weed when I know I have to drop a cup tomorrow. <laughs> we might say, I'll think in my head, right on with Jesus, but I'll keep my mouth shut, right? Or, I won't go to Thanksgiving. I won't go to Thanksgiving, and that'll be okay. Those of us who believe, whether we're right or not, that we've evolved to a certain place spiritually, or moved to a more enlightened perspective, or whatever we want to call it, sometimes look at people we think who don't quite have it yet, who might be at very large churches that look like spaceships. And, and we wonder how they can believe the things they believe, but the answer is they just aren't there yet. That's where they're comfortable. 
And in a, to a certain extent, we can try and enlighten them. But if they're not ready, they're not ready. But now let me flip it. I just finished reading this book I've mentioned called um, Love and Betrayal, or something like that, by, by a woman whose name really is Sandra Lee Dennis. And she talks about having been to the right place spiritually, evolved to a certain degree. She was at a New Thought church that meant she was into the law of attraction. And her partner leaves her six weeks before the wedding. He just takes off. She's devastated. She tries to manifest all the right things, right? She does all the progressive things that she's going to do that made her feel better. And it wasn't until she fell back and said, okay, God, I can't do this, after some years, that it started to change for her. So now I ask, who really is Morigo? And do we even know? Maybe it's better, instead of thinking about who's progressed, who's more knowledgeable, who has more insight, just to accept from these stories that we all are in a different place and drop the value judgments from them. And that that place changes over time. And to be aware of our tendency to do the things that shoot, us, shoot ourselves in the foot and, and work on getting rid of those and still maintain that there's going to be times and places when the best decision is to not go, regardless of the consequences. And that, in fact, choosing to not go has a lot more integrity than showing up and refusing to put the robe on. That spirituality is not just about what do we do, but really about all eight of the right of the um, noble eightfold paths: right action, right effort, and I would say right intention. If you don't show up at the banquet to piss off the king, it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> if you have a different reason, it could be a perfectly good decision. And, and maybe that's a, a glimpse of, of I think that is a glimpse of. of what ethics and morality is. It's, it isn't just black and white. There's a number of factors at work. And in this story, we're not talking about salvation or heaven or anything else, but maybe more about expectation and motivation and how much of ourselves are willing to invest in the spiritual life, in the spiritual process, and in growing into the fullness of whoever it is we're meant to.